Hey, what's up? We got a good episode this week. James and I catch up, chat a little bit about hardware wallets, also reflect on this year to finish off season four of Mind Details and answer a few questions. Also, you guys know what to do. Give us that five star rating on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, thumbs up on YouTube, uh, check out our Discord if you want to join a community. And if you have any questions or thoughts on the podcast, email us at mightydetailspodcast at gmail.com. And our website is mightydetailspodcast.com for links to all those things. And let's kick it off with our beautiful intro by Kyoshi the Kid. Welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. I, yeah, I got to do it closer to the mic. I'm doing it away from it. Yeah. Get that, cr- get that crisp the, ASMR. A little, uh, little beverage, a little bevy. Mm-hmm. How you been, man? Not bad. Um, tired. Very tired. Clara got pretty sick for like a day last week and it's totally knocked off her sleep schedule Mm. so she's going to bed at like 11 p.m Mm. which is not not ideal typical for a toddler that's like when i uh i you know i I probably eat lunch around 11 (laughs) p.m i I didn't know you were spanish nick i'm a i'm a night owl you know um yeah nice but uh but yeah late late nights early mornings i've gotten into this is this okay so there's this thing that i do in my life where something comes around and it's really popular and i'm like i don't want any part of that because (laughs) i'm trying to blaze my own stupid trail and uh so like when cold this is, this is a sign of getting old james yeah yeah no no no. but th- this has always been the case okay. for me okay. and it's a quality about myself that i don't i don't necessarily like but when cold brew came around i was just like whatever who cares like i got really into espresso at the time you know because i'm an obnoxious brooklyn resident but uh like my dad, my dad was like the first person I knew that got into cold brew and like, it's a funny story. He like brewed some and then drank it. Like he got so excited that he drank some at like 7 PM Oh no! and he was up until like three in the morning, yeah, like praying on his rosaries. <laughs> but, um, I like, I had done the espresso thing recently. I've gotten really into AeroPress, but then like even more recently, because like in the mornings I typically take Clara to give Allison a bit of like time in the morning to, you know, do whatever she wants to do, take a little bit more rest, whatever. So like, I can't be over in the kitchen doing like an elaborate coffee routine. And so I've just been like buying cold brew and just like, like at the grocery store. Yeah. I I actually get it on gorillas. What what brand do you get? S T O K. Is it stock? Stoke? Stoke. Something like that. Okay. But I mean, I you eventually get, it, you get it on gorillas. Is that a delivery service? Yeah. That's okay. like, have you, have we talked about this? Uh, do you know about these, all these new delivery services? Well, I believe, I feel like they've been rebranding. I, I actually think it, I actually think it's a scam. <laughs> okay. How is it a scam? Okay, no, 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 I no, always no. get what the, I order. It's not a scam for the consumers, but I'll tell you what, it, what, it, what it, my theory is. Okay. okay. Let's hear it. Um, so you're talking about these, grocery delivery services in New York city, these, and they're like, uh, famous for delivering your groceries in 10 minutes or less, mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I feel like DoorDash has one. I feel like, uh, there's a few other like five minute groceries. I think it's what it's called. 15 minute groceries or something like that. Yeah. Um, well there's, there's uh GoPuff, getter and gorillas are like the big, the ones that they're the ones of like this kind of variety that I, that I became aware of. Wait, so there's different varieties? Well, just just that like... The 15-minute delivery. The fi- okay. Yeah. Because I haven't heard of any of those. 
Uh, <laughs> but I have done, I think it's called like 15 minute groceries. And then there was a third one that I can't remember. Yeah. So there was like DoorDash, 15 minute groceries, and then something else. Um, but here's my theory, right? Okay. Let's hear it. I think this is a, this is a startup Silicon Valley scam. I think, I think. Oh, well, totally. <laughs> I think these businesses are not profitable at all. And I think it's really just a bunch of founders going and saying, oh, well, this is super easy. We just hire all the delivery people and just, uh, you know, do the Uber, but for groceries. And then we get a bunch of investment and then we get this. Well, the thing is, is like right now, it's like the early days of Uber where I feel like there's not a lot of surcharge on top of it. Like, I feel like I'm paying like maybe slightly above what I would if I actually went to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. But this is what I understand of the business is that they, they, um, rent, um, space that like a typical grocery store would never rent because it's not like for a typical grocery store, you would need a high traffic area Mm -hmm. for it to make business sense. Whereas they can be sort of anywhere, right? They can set up shop anywhere. And then like, yeah. Um, so in my case, they're like on a street where it's just like not a lot of like, not a lot of retail, like right. foot traffic or anything. But you see the like the signs for all these places where they have their sort of like hubs. But um, I mean, I use gorillas like pretty religiously. Interesting. I, okay. So you are, you are a, a it's, user. It's literally, it is literally like 10 minutes. Like, oh, and, I've, I've used my. I think I used whatever my service was uh, a couple times, especially when I had COVID. Cause I was like, well, I'm, you know, <laughs> well, yeah, um, that. And also I will say like being a parent, like you just like, there's only so many hours in the day between all the different things that you're doing. And like, you know, we're not living in the suburbs and getting in the car, going to the grocery store type thing. And sometimes you just need like, Oh, we're out of milk. Mm-hmm. Like it's just like those little things. You're out of this. You're out of that. Like, and so it's the modern day milkman. Oh yeah. And so like, yeah, you just like it's not it's not everything you can get at a grocery store, but it's like a lot of like the staples. Right. Um. And so wait, how do we get on that topic? Well, we we're talking about Stoke, but I do want to say like, yeah, I'm still like a little bit skeptical of the business the profitability. Well, I guess also Uber is not profitable. I don't feel like any of these businesses are profitable. I feel like it's just more of a yeah investment scheme. I don't know. I think my feeling is that it's early days investment money, and that's why like the prices are as low as they are. Because mm-hmm. now like Uber and Lyft, like the prices are much much higher than they used to be. Yeah. When I fir- when they first started up in in New York, and so I don't know what the future holds, but it's nice to like be able to order milk and diapers <laughs> like <laughs> at like 10 PM. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess that's, that's a good point. Cause I feel like for most of my friends, including myself, we probably aren't, you know, you know, especially more of my younger friends. It's like, we wouldn't really order milk cause we have time to go get milk or something. Yeah. And you know, I've done it a few times, but it's like, I, this feels like a weird kind of business. But yeah. And they definitely cropped up a lot during COVID these yeah. kind of businesses. Um, but yeah, finish your story about, uh, your cold brew obsession. Oh yeah. 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 So I just, no, no, I mean, it's not much of a story. It's just that I've like now become such like a cold brew head. Interesting. Okay. Cause like it's such, it's so easy in the morning to just like, pour it out, pour out some oat milk in there, mix it up, drink. Like I just need, I need that caffeine, that caffeine jolt in the morning Mm -hmm. because I'm a total addict. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think I will look into investing into like doing my own cold brew at home. Yeah. yeah. But right now I've just been doing this like store bought thing. Um, I like iced coffee. Yeah. I, I know that's a little different than cold brew, but yeah. Well, for me, it's about the efficiency of like, being able to drink it. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously I enjoy the taste as well, but I'm not, I've never been someone that just can like sit and like sip on a single coffee (laughs) for more than like five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. You chuck it down quick. Oh yeah. Very quick. I mean, same same with food. Mm -hmm. Like I eat food very quickly. My wife used to dislike how quickly I ate my food, but now (laughs) she likes it because I can like, cause Claire is often done before 
you know, we're done eating. So like if I can eat fast, then Claire and I can go play and Allison can can finish (laughs) eating dinner. So interesting. Okay. Yeah. Benefit in the long run, but nice man. Yeah. That's my exciting. (laughs) Your cold brew. Cold brew. Gorilla's lifestyle. Um, uh, what about you? What's new? Uh, I don't know, man. I've just been, you know, playing with my, uh, strap box, fat straps, been on my strap, strap trend. That's gross. Um, like, we don't need to know about you playing with your straps. <laughs> okay. We don't have to take it that far. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So you've been strapping wood. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't think there's any, uh, don't think there's any more updates to that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I will say, maybe to uh, talk a little about design news. I have some thoughts on a recent product launch. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh huh. So, Layer Design created or designed the new Ledger wallet called Stacks, hardware wallet. Yeah, you're gonna have to take me through this. Right. I I was ex- I'm step. excited for that, James. I was I'm <laughs> waiting all week. I've been waiting all week to tell you about hardware wallets. <laughs> Um, well, this is great because I I actually do think the idea of hardware wallets and crypto wallets in general is not an easy concept to grasp, especially I remember when I was starting out, it was like, what you have to like create a a passphrase or have to remember it or write it down on paper. And I was like so confused. Um, and especially when people were like, oh, you should get a, a physical hardware wallet. And I was like, what is a physical wallet? If if I lose it, do I lose all my money? Like, how does that work? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like, obviously, you know, if we think back to our Web3 episode about blockchain and, you know, digital trust, the, you know, one of the beautiful things is when you own crypto on the blockchain, only you can control it. There's no bank. There's no um, third party that can say, actually, you know, we'll take your money away. Um, so when you own it in your own wallet, it's, it's yours, you know, that means also that you could lose it too. So (laughs) it's a double-edged sword, but, um, you know, I think especially recently, you know, a few of the centralized, uh, crypto places have gone under. And so people are really, um, pretty keen on owning their own crypto now. Um, but the idea of a wallet is everyone creates like this account, um, and it comes with a wallet address, which is kind of like your account number. Um, and when you create a wallet, you get a, a seed phrase, which is like your passphrase, but you can't change it. It's not like a password on the on, on your bank. You can't like go and reset the password. Um, so it's this is like the, one of the most important things uh, about owning a wallet is never forgetting your seed phrase. Mm. Um, Wait, seed phrase equivalent to password? Mm-hmm. What kind of? Okay. Oh, I'm already this losing. This is one it. of those I'm insufferable <laughs> things about crypto. No, it's a seed <laughs> phrase, and you have to plant it um, in your crypto bed. <laughs> um, yeah, and then you farm it later. It's, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So essentially, whenever you create an account, uh-huh. you don't you you don't go to a bank, right? There's no way to like go to a bank and sign up. Or is it like a pin number? Uh, No, no. It's, it's usually 12 to 24 words that are automatically generated. And the words are like, you know, tree, car, bus. They're really simple words. And the reason being is you could memorize those words. Mm -hmm. You know, you can make up a little story like, um, you know, the bus goes to the, the train station to get, you know, I want you to read your seed phrase (laughs) to my daughter, (laughs) put her to sleep at night. (laughs) <laughs> uh, they do actually sound like like l- <laughs> lullabies or something. Uh, <laughs> um, but the important thing, if you take anything away from this conversation, is whenever you sign up for a wallet um, to hold your crypto, and you have to uh, remember your seed phrase, it'll tell you whatever your seed phrase is. You should always write it down on paper. Don't write it down on your computer. Don't take a screenshot of it. Don't even think about digitizing it. Mm. Um, don't take a photo of the paper that you wrote down. It should always remain physical and never digital. Uh, The reason being is if someone was able to hack into your computer and go through your, you know, Google Photos or your Notes app 
and find your seed phrase. Well, now they have your entire uh, bank account or crypto wallet. Yeah. Um, so again, going back to this idea that it's you know completely decentralized, you own it, it's completely trustworthy as long as you can trust yourself. <laughs> um, so that's what a wallet is, right? It's okay. just this way to store your own crypto yourself. Um, and they exist in many forms. So you can have one on the computer, just like an app on your computer, um, or you can have a physical object. And the reason you would get a physical object, a physical hardware wallet, which we're going to get to the, you know, the design news of that, but, <laughs> um, is going back to this idea that if someone was able to hack in your computer, um, and you had your wallet as a desktop app or as a browser extension, they could go in there, like pretend like you got like scammed, you know, on the phone. You ever see those scam callers? Oh yeah, I answer them every time. <laughs> and they're like, oh, can we can we just log into your computer and fix your computer? Um, you know, in that scenario, they could go in and log into your wallet and make a, make approvals that you didn't want and send money and, you know, steal, steal all your stuff. Um, so hardware wallets are different because they are essentially glorified physical buttons mm. that, you know, a hacker would actually have to physically come to your location and press the button on your little device. Mm. Um, because that's the only way that the wallet can be, um, approved, approve any transactions. Um, which is kind of interesting if you think about it, because it's this entire new technology is, you know, it's this like super digital, like, uh, I don't know, bits, you know, but it needs this physical aspect to it, right? Mm. Um, Wait, so this is solely for approving transactions or this is, Right, interacting with the blockchain. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if it's, you could send money, you could receive money, you could trade an NFT, you could, um, you know, vote in your DAO uh, governance or group or whatever. Um, anything you do on the blockchain, you would have to press a physical button mm. if you had a hardware wallet. Um, and also, one thing I, I do want to talk about is uh, the there was this misconception I had of, well, if I, if I lose my hardware wallet or if it breaks or if it gets like run over by a car, what happens? Like, is my money all gone? Is all the crypto gone? All the NFTs are gone? Um, no, the wallet is simply a button. It's simply like a remote control mm -hmm. for your crypto. Mm -hmm. Um, so you could buy another one. And of course you memorize your seed phrase. You would just enter your same seed phrase again. And then now you have an, a new remote control. Yeah. Um, so anyways, now that you understand hardware wallets, you understand hardware <laughs> wallets, I'm pretty sure James is sleeping through half of that, but uh, glad you made it through. I'm awake. I'm awake. Um, Too much cold brew this morning. Um, uh, Layer designed a hardware wallet. Yes. And there's not really many out there. Uh, they designed it for Ledger which is kind of the most popular company for hardware wallets. They also have like, in my opinion, probably the nicest design ones. Hmm. Um, there's also Trezor, which has, they all look kind of like USB sticks. Yeah. I feel like I've seen an ad for a USB stick that's like <laughs> expanded and there's a digital city popping out of it or yeah, something. It sounds like the vibe for sure. Yeah. Um, and the one that Lair designed looks nice. It's this little maybe credit card sized uh, design and it has a e-ink display and it wraps around the corner. Kind of, it kind of looks like a little notebook almost mm -hmm. a little like, um, I don't know. Uh, what's, what's, what are the one little fi oh, field notes? That's what it kind of reminds me of. Mm. Um, Kindle mixed with a field note. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I saw it when I first saw it, I was a little bit, um, I don't know, maybe critical of it because as I explained to you, like hardware wallets is kind of like this idea of this glorified button. And I actually think it's a really interesting new archetype for technology, right? Because 
we had the smartphone come out or, and especially in the beginning with cell phones, it felt like there were so many designs for cell phones, like the Juke or the flip phone or the Razor. There was like this proliferation of experimentation mm-hmm. in, you know, hardware that facilitates texting and calls. And we are, we don't get those archetypes very often. You know, we get like, we have a VR archetype, which is happening right now. Um, but this is kind of one that's been not explored very much. So I know I, I, I saw this and it, I was like, well, it kind of just looks like a, another smartphone thing. And so I was a little bit sad, but I think there are some really interesting things to note here. Um, the idea behind it was it's really marketed toward NFT collectors who want to show off their NFTs and, and secure them with a hardware wallet. And so you can put your NFTs on the display, which is cool. They also magnetic, they can stack together. Um, I will say, I don't know who made this decision, but they put a board ape in their rendering. I would, I just like, and I, I will say also someone else felt that way too. That was like such a tacky move. Like there are some beautiful, you know, NFTs and artists that you, we could have used here, but mm-hmm. we used the most ugly thing in my opinion. Well, it's also, but it's also the best known. Like it, I feel like people associate NFT with board ape at this point, whether you like it or not. Like that's how the public like immediately makes a connection board ape NFT. Yes. I think that was probably the thinking behind using the board ape. Cause I, if you used one of your other beautiful images, like then, a rock NFT rock, <laughs> then people would like, people might not see that and be like, Oh, that's a crypto wallet. Um, but also I agree. I, you're I, I, displaying, I understand you're displaying your NFT on a, on an e-ink screen, it's not. Yes, so this is where I'm starting. Now you're kind of seeing my reservations yeah. about this thing because to me, most people don't, you know what this kind of feels like? It kind of feels like someone designed an NFT wallet that doesn't collect NFTs. Um, and you know, I, I can't speak for layer design or, or uh, you know who also, um, worked on this project is Tony Fidel, the head of the iPod. Oh, um, from nest that guy, uh, does he, didn't he do the thermostat, the nest thermostat? He just released a book not too long ago about product development. Mm, Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Former CEO of nest labs. Yeah. Um, okay. So he worked on it as well. Yeah. With, on this one? Yep. With mm-hmm. with Layer. With, Interesting. with Layer and uh, for the company called Ledger. Um, and so, you know, obviously the goal for Tony and, and Layer was to design, quote unquote, the iPod of mm-hmm. NFT hardware wallets. Um, I think, you know, you do have to have some display so that you can read a transaction and approve it. Um, I think the e-ink display was a nice like touch, like as opposed to an LCD, it feels a little bit more tactile and tangible, um, less high tech, but I don't know. I think my reservations about it was, is just the fact that like, it's a button, it's a glorified button. It's not a place to display your NFTs. I mean, it's kind of like a, a nice little touch to like add an NFT to the outside of it. In my mind, I want like. I want like a nuclear launch pad, <laughs> yeah, you know, like with, with like a little, like a flip up, like clear case and like a big red button. And then like a display screen. That's like, do you wish to trade this NFT? And then I like, okay, flip up the little plastic turn cover, two keys, smash the red. Yeah. Turn the two keys. <laughs> um, I, I just feel like there's so many archetypes we could play into. Uh huh. And I just hate seeing another smartphone looking. Wait, thing. can I ask a dumb question? Why are they stackable? This is another thing that I'm like, it feels a little bit like kitschy or like trading cards. Like why, why would you need more than one? I don't know. (laughs) As someone who has NFTs and multiple wallets, you can store multiple wallets on one device. So I don't know. I, I, I seriously have to like ask someone like what their thought process was. Uh, they were like, listen, our firm name is Layers. We need more <laughs> one of these things to create depth here. Uh, well, maybe, maybe you can only have one wallet on one device, which is so. 
weird. Yeah. That's not a thing that happens on the other device. Seems excessive. I I mean, I don't know. I'm like totally coming in blind here. No, that's good. I mean, I think a lot of people are coming in blind here. Um have they on a on a tangential note, I thought that they had that that we have multicolor e ink screens or like is that not a thing? I, f- I feel like I saw something years ago that they were at least developing multicolor e-ink screens. It does. Uh, yeah, just a quick Google search. It looks like there's some colored e-ink I mean, I, I've always thought that that would sort of be like the ultimate, you know, because there's all this concern about what um, LED screens are doing to our eyes. Right. Like the idea of, of like doing multicolor, like getting to the point where a computer monitor or or whatever kind of screen can just look like a print on paper rather than a backlit LED. Like I mean, Harry, of course... Like Harry Potter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, a backlit LED has a lot of advantages, but um, yeah, I've, I've just like always kind of been curious about that. Maybe that'll be V2 for this wallet is a multicolor yeah. screen. If, you, if it really is like you know if one of its major features is about displaying nfts yeah i don't understand yeah yeah why they would just do an e-ink screen i understand well, it for like battery that, and that for, was that's yeah. the big push uh, i think i was reading the article in wired about it but the idea is that you the other thing too is a lot of times if you store stuff in a hardware wallet, it's not something you use frequently. Mm. Um, most of your frequent transactions are on your desktop. But if you want to store expensive things, like your like your board ape, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you would put it in a hardware wallet. Yeah. Um, but you wouldn't interact with it that much. You're going to put it in a drawer and not use it. So this is going back to this whole thing of like, why display it? I don't know. Yeah. I, I will say like, I obviously admire Layer and Tony Fidel and Ledger for doing something beautiful in this space. It is a really beautiful design and it's a nice object. It just has a lot of questions around it, especially coming from someone who I feel like I'm pretty knowledgeable in the NFT space. I don't know. I will say, here's an example of a hardware wallet that I actually really like where where it's going. So Jack Dorsey, who was, I guess he founded Twitter and Square and some other companies. Yeah. Um, or maybe not some other companies, but he was working on a hardware wallet that looks like a little pebble. Mm. And it just has a simple button on it. You can connect it to your computer. And he has like, you know, five different like variations where one's like marble, one's like granite. And it just has a button. And I like that I that romantic idea of it's a literal hard where while it's a literal stone. Yeah. It's something that you can put in your pocket and feel. Yeah. And it still executes the function of connecting and having a physical button. But it's more this romantic idea, this romantic interpretation of this new archetype. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if it's I mean, I in thinking about the one by layer I wonder if it's a more, if it's intended to be more of like a skeuomorphic approach of like, hey, here's something kind of familiar to you in terms of tech and like, so that it can bring in people who haven't adopted the technology yet, like make it a bit more understandable. Whereas I think like the Jack Dorsey one is maybe a bit more abstract. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah, like maybe doesn't doesn't feel as accessible. I think that's a good observation. It does kind of feel like Pokemon cards or baseball cards. Right. It's like the size of a baseball card and you stack them yeah. together. I well, guess. it also doesn't help that like NFTs also feel like Pokemon. Right. You know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. I I probably, yeah, I need to like stop hiding under a rock and really get to understand all this stuff. Well, we got you on the cold brew train. Now we just got to get you on the NFT train. <laughs> um, now we just got to get me on Adderall. Oh, no. So I can really dive in. 
but anyways, yeah, I mean, congrats to Lair team. I mean, that's a big project to be able to work with Ledger and uh, Tony Fidel. Yeah. Um, to do a to do a pretty significant, like that's a pretty big object to design. This There's not many hardware wallets out there, and to design one for the biggest hardware wallet company, it does kind of feel like the iPod of hardware wallets. I think time will tell whether it'll be the actual iPod or if it'll just be, you know, the BlackBerry. Yeah. And that's, that's actually what Tony Fidel was quoted saying. It's like, we're trying to design the iPod, but it's too early to say whether we're the iPod or the BlackBerry. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, you know, it's, um, do you remember when the iPod came out? There's the first generation iPod, which had, it had the wheel but it clicked and it, it had, actually rolled. Well, right? it, yeah, it clicked. It actually did. Yeah. It spin. It really spun. And then they had the buttons, like the buttons were sort of concentric to the wheel, right? But like, uh, chopped up into four different buttons, you know, sort of, um, quarter circles around this wheel. Yeah. The second generation broke out the buttons from the wheel as like, like a row above the wheel. Right, yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if the wheel still spun at that point or not. Um, like, I wonder what, why they why they did that. Like, why the team ended up doing that. I wonder if it was like, if they were getting a lot of failure in the first generation, if like they were, they were encountering a lot of like um, product failures, engineering issues. Uh, quality control issues around it. Um, well, let me just call Johnny up right quick. And <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. We also have the rate. It's 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 winter time. I hear the radiator in the background. Yeah, so it's not too bad on the audio. But I think was it right after that that they did the touch, like the more touch and and the haptic that's, click. I, f- I feel like that's when it blew up with yeah. with the touch. I mean, there was definitely a few early adopters with the just the the original version but yeah i feel like oh when the when the nano came out that's when it took off I which which one nano which which nano well well there was like, the sh- there was the shuffle yeah, i feel like the original nano the nano which one which one was the original nano i need to Just see the, it because there was ipod ipod mini shuffle it's not the shuffle what which one was the original nano this one the, right the little stick the longer one. Oh yeah um, and of course they made several versions of that one. Well, which, which one was your first one? I had the square one. Remember that one? The, the, was that also a nano? Yeah, that was, the, That's I the, think the video one. Isn't that the one that Scott Robertson and minimal did the, uh, did the watch band for? No, that's your thing of the shuffle. I did. I had this one. Oh yeah. That guy was nice. Oh my gosh. Wait, can I get a, can I get a sense of scale there? Uh, I think it was like. Two inches tall, maybe? Yeah. That's so wild. Those are, those are so... This is what I'm saying is like, you know, the, these iPods were this archetype, this this new archetype for for MP3 players. And there was a lot of different designs. Yeah. But this one won out. I don't know. We'll see what happens with the hardware wallet. Um, yeah. But yeah, let's see. What else we got going on here? I guess this is our like season finale. I don't know. Yeah. You got any holiday plans? Yep, going back to Florida. Just gonna just gonna get warm for a couple of weeks and then come back to the bitter cold. Um, New York in January and February is a bleak place. Um, but yeah, that's that's the that's the general plan. Just to do Christmas in Florida. Nice. Yeah. What about you? Going to Austin. Christmas. In oh, Austin. nice. Whole family's coming. Nice. Um, I mean, my sister lives in Austin now, so. It's always good to go and see her. How soon until you move to Austin? Are you going to move? I've thought about move it. Move with the tech bros? I've thought about it. Uh, I, I definitely thought about it harder when uh, the pandemic was going on in New York. And yeah. New York was not the most exciting and fun place to be. Yeah. Um, now that it's back to normal, it feels... It's, a less, it's less high on my mind. Mm-hmm. But one day... One day I'd like to buy some land and whether that's in Texas or not, I don't know. Um, yeah. It would be nice to be with my sister and be close to her. And I think obviously Austin is a creative hub. So, and you know, Texas is, Texas is big land's cheap out there. Yeah. I'm curious to see what comes out of Texas in like a couple of years. Yeah. 
because like it's just all this migration has happened right. but i but we're, we've like sort of yet to see what fruit it bears right yet um but yeah it is it is pretty interesting yeah I, definitely a lot of people i you know a lot of friends have moved there and stuff um, as as the end of the year approaches have you done any self reflection you thought about the past year i think my whole year was self reflection to, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> just surrounded by mirrors you, you know I, see the <laughs> amount of mirrors in here all he does is self reflect um yeah i think Obviously, this year was kind of a big year for me to pivot, recenter, re reevaluate my mission and goals. And I really am, feel really comfortable where I'm at now in terms of what I want to do. And, you know, I, I know we've talked about this a couple of times on the episodes, but like, it, you know, for a long time, I just kind of went with the flow, was just designing to design and really loved it, you know, embraced every project that came my way. And now that I feel I have a vision for the studio and where I want to go, I just feel a lot more directed towards mm. something. Um, yeah. So I think I definitely feel very energized now and very focused on executing that vision. I feel like next year is going to be execution year. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, obviously I've been like watching what you've been doing up close and at a distance at the same time. Cause like, you know, I know what it is to like come and see you and see what you're working on, but then also see like publicly how mm. you're presenting it. <laughs> How's it different, James? Tell them, tell them the secrets. I don't know. I don't know that it, I don't know. Well, it's, it's I, all would, fake. I would just say like, I feel I feel like when it came to your individual branding, it just felt like a subtle yet like important refinement on like what you were doing. Mm. Like that's, that's kind of how I feel in general about what I've seen from you lately and like, and, and what you did with your website is it, it just feels, yeah, it feels more refined and focused but like, I'm also just happy to see like the content being produced again. Yeah. Cause I, cause like for a while I was sort of like missing the content that you were producing that was like, you know, more playful behind the scenes, getting a real sense of like who you are as a designer and your approach to design. Right. And I think you've been showing that a lot more recently. Yeah. Be, you know, now that you've come out of this rebranding phase. And so like, I'm, I've been like excited to see that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. What about, what do you got going on? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. What was this year for you? Like, man, I mean, it was, it was tough and rewarding and like terrible a, twos, a lot of growth. Yeah. A lot of growth this year. Obviously, you know, our, our kid is growing up in front of our eyes at like a pace that is just like incredible. And, you know, it's just like, it's remarkable every day. I feel like I can, sometimes when you're so close to something, you can't really see how things are changing. But I do feel like there are moments where I'm just like, like, wow, she's just she's like grasped this whole new element of like what it is to be a person and yeah. like language or just like her physical capabilities. And it's just wild to see, um, on like a professional level, it was really, I mean, it was kind of a tough year because of obviously I'm working at Peloton. People know that there's been like right. multiple rounds of layoffs and it's across it's across many industries i think yeah it's kind of the the pullback from the the boom during pandemic you know i've heard uh there's this guy scott galloway who's like he kind of 
he kind of like reports, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think he was like a finance guy. He, he like reports on a lot of like tech and, and stuff like that. And he calls it the, like, I think it, he called it like the Patagonia vest recession or something <laughs> that, that like, yeah, the tech, the tech industry, a lot of, a lot of layoffs happening. I'm kind of curious because of all the layoffs, like at a time like this, this is when a lot of people take that chance on like a new venture. Mm. Like they'll like, they'll be like, well, I should just go for it. Right. Cause life is short or whatever. Right. How, uh, you know, I, and so I'm like kind of curious what's going to come out of this time that there's all these, these people being laid off talented people too. Like, at our company at Peloton, like there were a lot of talented people that were let go just simply because of what they were working on, not because of who they were as like people in terms of their skill level or right. anything. It was just like, you're working on that project. That project is no longer mission critical. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, and, and so like we lost, you know, a lot of super talented people. Um, and yeah, I mean, I got a lot, I got a lot out of what I personally needed from this experience, which was to like, you know, I think I've talked about this before, but working in isolation can, at least for me, like has some detrimental effects right. to like my growth as a designer and as a creative person and, and like, my confidence and, and things like that. So like being able to work alongside people who have like skills and abilities that I admire and to like actually watch their workflow from up close rather than like, I don't get a lot of inspiration and motivation from just like looking at Instagram. Yeah. Like I, I admire a lot of things that I see on there, but it's not as motivating to me as like sitting next to somebody who's like a rock star and just watching their mm. workflow and being inspired by that and the For way sure. that they carry themselves, the way that they interact with the organization. So that's been really great for me is just like being able to see like really great designers and talent from up close um, and to sort of like understand where I fit in to that mix. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, yeah, so it's been, it's been a really, it, it's, you know, definitely a lot of ups and downs, but like, uh, now it's starting to like feel like getting into a groove. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be, I think it'll be interesting. I mean, I, you make a lot of good points about the, I, I, I do kind of miss that being independent where you, you kind of have to find other ways of seeking out those inspiring designers and chatting with them. You know, obviously you're a good friend and I have other good friends that are great designers and I always ping them regularly on ideas and topics and try to keep up to date. But you you know, when you're working next to someone every day, that's a, a really valuable. Yeah. And I think like there's, there's also something about, cause I, I'm like not a very competitive person. I think I've talked about this on the podcast before. Like I'm not, I'm not a competitive person in that. Like I'll see somebody doing something and I'll be like, Oh, I can do it better than they can. I'm just like, you know, in a, like in large part, I'm trying to, f trying to figure out how I can bring my sensibilities to the table in a way that enriches everything else. So I guess, I don't know, like, I guess inherently I'm more of like a team player than a, than an independent, mm -hmm. I guess. That's not to say like one is more valuable than the other, but I, I think I do just like crave that collaborative yeah. um, kind of creativity. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's also something I feel like we lost during the pandemic. Yeah. And I, I, I wouldn't say that 
that I feel like most companies are starting to come back to in-person collaboration in the studio design. I always feel like that's the most valuable, the most, I don't know, it just feels like it's way easier to come up with great ideas if you're just bouncing back and forth with someone physically in the studio. It's also just really so much better for decision making. Mm, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. It just I can already feel like the amount of emails sending back and forth or Slack messages of like Oh my god. Maybe we should do it this way. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and the, you know, there's there's just like there's a and I'm sure it's different for everybody, but there's certainly like an energy and a vibe to being in a room meeting with people versus like being in your bedroom meeting with a yeah. bunch of people online. Like there's just, I don't know, like I don't know what biologically this is, but there's just like, you know, there's, there's something in the air. Right. But now we got metaverse now. James. <laughs> <laughs> we can get in the VR headset. Yeah. Metaverse needs to be able to like pick up and transmit pheromones or something. Right, right. For, gotta, for the there's always that one person that didn't wear enough deodorant. That, <laughs> that's that adds to the vibe, you know, <laughs> That's the urgency so of the make, meeting. Make this decision now. <laughs> We're in a glass glass box. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So, I think I think yeah. I think generally, like I've just learned a lot about myself and and where I sort of thrive and how I deal with like change and like I don't know how to where where i derive sort of energy from in yeah. in my process that's good um but yeah should we uh answer some questions yeah i think we should answer some questions all right we got a question you need here to increase from, the uh, font size or i'm, need to <laughs> I'm gonna it. be very impressed if you can read that oh i can read it i think you're a little farther away than i, than I am um all right so this one comes from joey they say, hey, Nick and James, by not having a true industrial design position or real industrial design experience, am I pigeonholed in my current role working in fabrication and manufacturing? Graduated from school about two years ago and have been working in the fabrication shop since. I've been looking and applied to countless IDE jobs, no longer being a student. How easy is it to get internships or full-time job in design? Is posting, social, is posting on social media work my design work is posting on social media, my design work doing anything to help this process. What else can I do to get noticed or gain experience? Thanks, Joey. So Joey's asking essentially without having design experience and mainly working in fabrication, is there a way to pivot into industrial design? Um, Yes. I mean, I guess there's always, there's always a way, but does it say if Joey studied industrial design? Graduated uh, from school about two years ago. I would, ass I, I would assume that, that he's got experience. I might've, I might've shortened this email. Maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's why I was like a little bit chopped up. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we've talked about this a little bit. I think, well, I, I kind of feel like it's changed quite a bit in the past couple of years in terms of, I think more people are questioning traditional college route, right? Mm. Traditional academia. Yeah. And it's kind of seeking out alternatives, whether that's online education or internships. Um, you know, we could pull up the, the old paid versus free internship thing again. I don't know. I, I think it's, it, it would be a question to ask, like if you save up enough money, is it worth it to, to email your top 10 favorite design students and just say, Hey, I'll work for free. I just want to get into the industry. Um, you know, if you're, if you already have a job, you're just kind of working at the fabrication shop you know, maybe you could save up and do that. Um, I also do think, I think a big underrated part of 
normal jobs is that you are working there eight hours a day and you still have four hours of your own personal time. You could obviously trade that. I know that it's always tough to do that, especially when you work at a job and you come home really tired. But I mean, I remember doing extra work when I came home from my full-time job at Petmate. And I remember there was definitely some days where I was like, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. But I kind of made that decision to, you know, post every day on social media back in, I don't know, what was that, 2018, 2017? Um, Yeah. I mean, I definitely think posting on social media will will help get you noticed, probably for freelance work. And then you could kind of pivot from there into a full-time position. Um, You know, is there anything else that Joey could do to get experience or gain notice? I'm trying to think of, of sort of like, I mean, I know that there are fabrication shops within some big design companies. Mm, that's a good and I, thought too. I mean, some sometimes roles are like, you know, Apple is like, listen, if you're coming in here as a CAD sculptor, <laughs> you're staying a CAD sculptor. Yeah, you're yeah. not moving into the ID team. Don't even think about it. Yeah. But I would imagine there's other companies where that's kind of like m- move into a different um, into a different department might be more encouraged. So like, you know, it, that m- that might be a path. It's like have you maybe, ever heard of anyone doing that? Uh, I'm trying to think. I would say it's. I would say. It'll get you in the door, but I do feel like it's a tricky pivot because the, the gut reaction I have is as a designer, I'm going to the fab shop or the print shop to get someone to help me make my design. Yeah. And if they're going to be, well, you know, maybe you should do it this way or mm. maybe you should do it that way. or It's I mean, just going to be one extra headache in my mind. I mean, we have a f- fabrication shop at Peloton. Right. Um, and... I I interact mostly with the like the 3D print shop that we have there um and the person who oversees that shop like I will send her things like that might be too large for the printers and she will like yeah like chop it up and be like hey like is this does this okay does this work like for you the, you know and and oftentimes it does. But that's like, not a design. That's not a design job. Right. But um but no, I mean like I think maybe getting close to industrial designers like is better than than I, I don't know better what than kind of yeah, I would it's agree. Better, better than, than nothing. nothing. Yeah. I mean the other thing is is like maybe there's a job somewhere out there that's maybe not as like sexy as the typical, like whatever people think is the hottest job right now within ID, but maybe there's a role somewhere at a super small firm, just somewhere that you can get your foot in the door and start to like get a portfolio together, a professional portfolio of work. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of our like crowdsourced map of, of design jobs. Like That's right. yeah, yeah. if you're in a city where there's ID jobs, um, then maybe, yeah, maybe that's a route. I don't know. Like, I feel like we've gotten a lot of these questions in the past of, of like how to move into ID from like, a engineering or yeah, from, the fab, and, I haven't heard too much fab fabrication. Yeah. I feel like most people that go into fabrication really love making things. So they right. kind of like, they kind of like yeah. staying there. Well, and that makes me wonder like, what is it about in indu- like industrial design that, that this person is like want craving more than their current role? Yeah. Um, is it more of like strategic or is it just like, designing mass manufactured products. I mean, that does beg the question of if Joey enjoys making things, maybe there's a pathway to start a small brand, Mm -hmm. a small houseware brand, make stuff on your own. I mean, the first thing that pops to my mind is Ugg Monk Mm -hmm. because they have great design and it's like kind of 
you know, handmade or small batch made, um, pretty simple to make. So that could be another pathway is like maybe work on a little small thing. Yeah. Yourself, do a little Kickstarter or something. I, I, I feel like I've maybe said this before, but I don't, you know, I don't know that in my future I'll ever like work with a Johnny Ive or like be in an organization where there's like, you know, I tried to go to Fuse Project out of school and I tried to do all these things. So <laughs> you like, tried to go to Fuse? Yeah. And I tried to go to Minimal and like, yeah. you know, the, none of yet. these places really <laughs> accepted me. But I've, but I've often thought like if I couldn't do that, then like, wouldn't it be cool if I could design something that would be on their desk? Oh, you know, that's like, fun. I like that. So, so like, you know, and I don't know if that, that would happen, but, um, yeah, I just like, I think that if you can't, if you can't find that ID role, it doesn't preclude you from like creating design and creating beautiful design to like, to sell to people or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, maybe one more question. Let's see. This one comes from Sammy K. Sammy says, I'm a new listener to, to you guys, but I really think you're one of the best ID podcasts out there. Oh, thank thanks, you, Sammy. Sammy. I go to San Jose State and listen to y'all while commuting to ID class and coming back. Nice, nice use of y'all. <laughs> Anyhow, I had a quick question. I consider my traditional media sketching and rendering to be top tier, quote unquote, for a student. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta see, got see your work, Sammy. Uh, Yet digital media continues to frustrate me. In the workplace, especially now that digital sketching is more prevalent, do employers find traditional media more impressive and distinguished, or are they basically the same, especially for portfolio work and the like? Thanks for taking the time to read this, guys, and please don't hesitate to take another break. Sincerely, Sammy. So what I understand is that they are... They're good at the sketching at like the sort of the traditional skills, mm -hmm. but they're, they don't feel very confident in, in like CAD and rendering. Uh, is, I was interpreting digital media as digital sketching, but mm. that no, I consider myself my traditional media sketching and rendering to be top tier. Um, it feels to me like it's digital sketching versus physical sketching, mm. but you know, maybe I'm reading it wrong. Oh, now I mean, the it, digital it, it sketching kinda, is kinda, more prevalent. It's kind of in, ambiguous, but um, yeah, I would say that I've gotten away with not being a, a very good digital renderer, like digital sketcher. I don't, I don't know that it's as much in demand now that you can render stuff, CAD and render things. It is so much wild. more quickly. It does feel like digital sketching was this very short time period between we were pretty much, you know, the iPad became more prevalent. Obviously you had the Wacom tablet and iPad made it a lot more accessible to do digital sketches. But at the same time, rendering fidelity and ease of use has increased mm -hmm. significantly. So it's almost like we, there was this short window of digital sketching. I think if like the digital sketchers that I've seen more recently that I'm like, you know, that are very impressive people that I've worked with, I mean, they're using a lot of hacks that, I mean, are, I think are fairly well known, like using CAD as an underlay like if there are any parts that you can reuse from other things, yeah. they're just like rendering those out, bringing those in. Like for, for myself, I have always been more comfortable with like hand sketching on paper. Although I do sketch in like notes, but that's not really the kind of digital sketching. I imagine this person's talking about, I right. imagine they're talking about like Photoshop, like somewhat photorealistic rendering, yeah, like concept sketches you'd probably present to your boss or something. Yeah. I you don't... Wouldn't, you wouldn't present a notes app sketch to your boss, would you? Oh, yeah. You would? My, you would like you my design out? manager or like somebody outside of the design team? No, like if you were... Say you were going to do a presentation of 
your concepts for this latest, you know, detail? Would you print out your notes app sketches or would you do something else? I would probably, it would, if I got to that point, it would most likely be renderings. Okay. And not sketches. Got it. I think I would do a bunch of hand sketches to like figure Figure things out. Yeah. But then I would do quick CAD. I would say it's more important to get fast at CAD than it is to get good at digital sketching. Yeah. That like, I think digital sketching is probably like still pretty valued at like maybe car design or Mm. something like something that's where it's kind of difficult to yes i would agree so if if it's difficult to cad traditional stuff so i would say shoes uh accessories cars yeah which all those are very kind of accessories and like backpacks and bags and stuff those are very hard to 3d model and traditional software of course gravity sketch is disrupting all three of those as well um but yeah i would agree with you on that sense yeah. If you're not using Gravity Sketch. Yeah. I, I think I think just like being able to swiftly create CAD for what you're doing. And if you have to like post process edit the CAD, because like, you know, you have to fix a surface or something like after it's rendered, then like learning how to use Photoshop to edit. Mm-hmm. Uh, like just bits of what you're working on. I mean, you should know, I, I feel like you should know also some tricks of like Photoshop in order to like manipulate your renderings to like get to yeah. what you're trying to convey. Sprink a little magic on it. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I just don't, I think digital sketching is a nice to have. It's not a need to have Yeah, for employers. Yeah. I think thinking about, some of the great portfolios that I've seen, obviously as I feel like I look a lot more like furniture and and stuff like that, where it's almost all final products and projects, but thinking back a little bit more, I think the stuff I enjoy is definitely more the, the thumbnails sketches where you see like just normal pen and paper, where you see that spark, where you see someone have that genius idea. And then you see kind of the, the, the development of that idea. Um, usually that development kind of manifests itself into CAD or like prototypes, small little prototypes or some rough renders. And then finally you see a nice, you know, photography of the product. Yeah. I always think back to this, um, the presentation of creative sessions at the square one conference, like a couple of years ago, the one where we did the live podcast and they were doing sketches on post-it notes, like scanning them and then like doing very mm. minor rendering work on top of those sketches. Yeah. Which was also like something that I was experimenting with, which was like taking pen on photos. paper, taking photos and just doing like light rendering mm-hmm. on those. I think like, you know, that's enough to convey if you can sketch communicatively, that's like most important. And then like use renderings to like sell it. Right. You know, in in a way. Yeah. Yeah. That feels like where it's at right now. For sure. I definitely think like a few years ago it was digital sketching was a lot more prevalent, but yeah, I think you're right. We're definitely heading into the quick and quick and quick and dirty renders. And now we're getting into AI (laughs) and like, you know, you can just type in what you want. Um, we had some AI news, but we skipped it. I f- totally forgot about it. That's okay. That's fine. We 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 had some good chatting here. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's helpful, Sammy. Uh, thanks for sending in the question. Yeah. And if you're listening and you have a question, send it to minor details podcast at gmail dot com. We like to hear from you. And if you have like a topic idea or anything, uh, please send it over. And. Yeah, man. Well, congrats on the season finale. Yeah. Season four Congrats finale. to you, too. <laughs> um, I think we'll call it. Uh, as always, I'm Nick. I'm James. Peace. Later. <laughs>